Jesus must increase, but we must decrease. Two weeks ago, I, uh, I mentioned that when Jesus talked about little ones, that you and I were those little ones. That I was an almost 36-year-old little one, and that uh, in the week behind us, I had visited uh, a 90-year-old little one with a 22-year-old little one that just moved. And uh, all those that are looking to Jesus Christ and trusting Him and saving faith that, that we are the little ones. Little ones, it can just simply mean believers. The children of God who were born, as the Gospel of John tells us, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The children of God that we now are. Not that we will be, not that we might be someday somewhere else, but the children of God that we right now are. That same apostle, he writes that in his first letter. Children of God by adoption. In the supernatural sense that it's ours in the eternal Son of God, because the Son came to make more sons, and He came to make daughters. He didn't just come to take away our sins, but He came to make us family. And so we call God Father. We, we just sang that. I think we sing that about every week. We're used to that, right? Romans 8 tells us that His Spirit testifies with our spirit, that, that His Spirit causes us to cry out to Him that way. But I want to remind you, and I do this from time to time, but I want to remind you of how radical that was in the history of this world and God's interaction with it. Understand that we've got 39 books in our Old Testament. That is 929 chapters, 23,145 verses. If you ever divide up your Bible, most of it's Old Testament. It looks something like that. And in all those books, with all those chapters and verses and words and references to God, there's only about a dozen ever where he's called Father. And it's never individual. And even of those roughly one dozen, there are only two in the whole Testament where it's someone actually saying that to God, speaking to him in that way. But then comes Jesus. Amen? Then comes Jesus into the story, and he's saying it all the time. In fact, it's one of the reasons that they wanted to kill him, because he called God his Father. But Jesus is telling us, in the way that he taught us, even in how we're to pray, don't just listen to me doing this. This is for you. He's your Father, too. And as he does that, as he makes us the children of God, he is elevating us, and he is bringing us right up to the throne of our Father. And he's saying this to us. He's saying, you're not far away from him, not anymore. This is how close that you are. And then after his resurrection, he says, tell my brothers that I ascend to my father and that I ascend to your father. And all of a sudden, every writer of the New Testament is inspired and instructed by the Spirit to start talking that way. Paul does it. Peter does it. James does it. Jude does it. Philip does it. He just doesn't write a book as he does it, but he does it too. And the takeaway is that as much as Jesus did it, we can do it too. And Jesus did it just in the Gospel of John over a hundred times, crying out to him, praising him, asking him in all circumstances. And you and I are not only welcome to do the same, but by the blood that he shed for us that we're going to remember today, we are expected to come to him. We are expected to approach him as our father because we are children of God in the supernatural sense. This morning, I want to remind you of the heart of God for children in the natural sense. Some of us, when we were children in the natural sense, if we were raised in the church, we'd sing songs like, Jesus loves the little children, right? All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Or how about this one? How about Jesus loves me? This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, where does it tell me? Mark chapter 10, for starters. Let's open our Bibles and our hearts there. And let's see it together. Mark chapter 10, starting with verse 13 this morning, a text that I think is about as perfect as you could find on a Sunday before we restart our children's ministries on Wednesday night. I didn't plan that. I would love to have planned that, but I didn't. This was all him. Mark chapter 10, starting with the 13th verse and as you find your place with me, I want to ask that you stand with me if you're able to. 
reference to what God has spoken. This that we are beholding this morning is the Word of God. These are the words of God, and they are given to us by God the Holy Spirit, by His inspiration, by His love. I think we ought to receive them as such this morning. I think we ought to receive them with great expectation. And they were bringing children to Him so that He might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. And may that same Jesus... The same for us this morning through his spirit. Say it with me if you believe it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Whoever has ears to hear this morning, let him hear his prayer. Father in heaven, how good it is to call you. The God we sang so much about this morning in that, in that new song together. Father. The one who commands all the hosts of heaven and, and makes every king bow down and makes darkness tremble with a whisper. Our Father, whose beauty demands praise, whose splendor outside, outshines the sun, whose, whose majesty rules with justice. That's our Father, whose glory consumes like fire, whose power can raise the dead, whose name remains undefeated. Our Father. God, may our time spent here, may it be precious, may it be deliberate. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your word. Open our ears that we might hear life again. Open our hearts. Make them even more yours. You are good. You do good. You intend good for us. We, we look to you in faith through the work of our perfect Savior, Jesus, who died Father, to be the amen to every one of your promises, and it rose that we might rise, yes, to resurrection life one of these days, yes, to heaven one of these days, but that we might even rise today as heirs of all things with him, the children of God, that we are the welcomed and the wanted in your presence forever, and now we're sitting at your feet, and Lord, we're believing because of his own word, Jesus' own word, that our Father won't give his children a stone when they come asking for bread. Give us bread this morning. We won't leave here like we came. In Jesus' increasing name, the church would you have your mind this morning. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Just four verses this morning. That's a third of last week's text when we considered the teaching of Jesus on divorce. Uh, that message is out there if you missed it. I know a lot of you were traveling for the holiday. It's good to have you back. Uh, but just four verses today. The first of which starts this way. And they were bringing children to him. Him is Jesus. But who is they? Luke can help us with that. Because in, in his telling of this story, there is actually a possessive word attached. These are parents bringing their children. And he says some of them were even bringing babies. Brand new to this world. I got one of those right now. He's adorable. He's already a couple inches taller and a couple pounds heavier than he was in just a month. There are clothes that already don't fit him, that used to fit him. It's wild. And this is him next to a pie that maybe Stratton baked for him. His name, his name, you probably can't see, but his name's poked in the top. But he shared it with us because he's a good boy. And it's, uh, it's good. I don't think that's why he got so big. I don't think he had any of it. But uh, they were bringing children to Jesus so that he might touch them, it says. Well, well why? Were they sick? Right? I mean, that's usually why people were brought to Jesus. They had a demon, right? Or they had some condition, they had some problem, or, or they didn't have their, their eyesight or their hearing or a working pair of legs beneath them. And because he was the one that could change all that, people would bring people to him because no one that would receive a touch from Jesus ever walked away the same. And we got nine whole chapters behind us in this book that show us that. But it's not that here. Matthew helps us this time. They brought him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. They were after a blessing. And in the parents of these little ones, they came and they said, they're not too little for that. They're not too young for that. Can I show you why we know that's true? 
And I mean beyond Jesus' words in the next few verses, which we're obviously going to look at. But when Stephen's preaching, this is Acts chapter 7. When Stephen's preaching, he's recounting the story of the Old Testament. And he says, when Moses was born, he was beautiful to God. I don't think that means he was just cute. I think that means that he was precious to God. That God saw him as precious. In Hebrews chapter 11, that's remarking on the faith of Moses' parents who had to defy the king of Egypt to keep their baby alive. It says that they saw him as beautiful. It's the same word in the English. It's the same word in the Greek. And here's our takeaway from that. They saw their child the way God saw their child. And when you see anything the way God sees it, how you decide to think about it, how you decide to act around it, how you decide to engage with it, all of that's going to be different. Your heart's going to be different. Husbands, if you see your wives the way God sees them, you're going to love them differently. You're going to speak to them differently. You're going to speak about them differently. That's God's daughter. Wives, same thing's true of you toward your husband if you see them the way God sees them. If you see your job the way God sees it, you're going to put in your hours differently. You're going to work in such a way that's going to make somebody out there say, man, if we could just clone that guy. He doesn't waste time like the rest of them. He's not lazy. He's not a gossip. He's not a complainer. In fact, he works like we pay him a lot more than we do. Here's a secret. He knows that God put him there as a witness, as a testimony in that place, and that something eternal is being done between the hours of 9 and 5 o'clock. He knows that he might have applied for the job, but God's the one that gave him the job. And he knows that he works for God and not for them. If you see your government the way God sees it, listen. If you see your government the way God sees it. You're going to honor the next president no matter who it ends up being in November. And you can vote against them. And you can disagree with them. But you're going to think about them. And you're going to speak about them. And you're going to pray about them very differently than you would if you didn't see them the way God sees them. If you see this church the way God sees it, you're going to serve differently. You're going to relate differently. You're going to give differently. You're going to prioritize differently. If you think to yourself, well, this thing's going on, but man, I get to be in God's house today. How many of you are really going anywhere else? If you think that way. How many of you really, if, if you think the way that God thinks about the church, and he sees it as the, the pillar that's holding up the truth in this village, how many of you are going to let that pillar fall into disrepair? How many of you, if you're going to see it missing some pieces, you're not going to go out and try to find those living stones and put them back together in the pillar? If you see it the way that God sees it, we need to see things the way that God sees them. 1 Corinthians says this, it says, we have the mind of Christ. So we can do that. We can see things the way God sees them because we have the mind of Christ. But Romans says that our minds need renewed. That's the word that's used, renewed. My birthday's in just a couple of weeks, so I had, to, I had to renew the registration on my car. I have what I need to drive it right now, right? But what I have needs to be renewed. I've got to invest more. I've got to go through a process. Our minds need renewed. God gave us a process. Something that he wants us to invest in. He gave us his word. And every example that I just mentioned of how you see your wife, how you see your husband, how you see your job, how you see your president, how you see your church, they all came from his word. And these parents, they saw their children the way God saw them. As precious as not too young to be brought to Jesus, so they're bringing them to Jesus, who is the visible image of the invisible God, according to Colossians chapter 1, and God himself in the flesh, according to John chapter 1. They probably didn't know that. They just knew that he was a great and wise teacher. They just knew that he had the favor of God and that he spoke the word of God with authority and with testifying signs like something they'd never seen before. They knew that much, and that was enough. 
There's a lot of history behind the blessing of children. We could do a real deep Bible study on it on a Wednesday night, maybe one of these days. I'm not going to do it today. I'm not going to go that deeply. But go all the way back to the ninth chapter of your Bible, and you'll find Noah blessing his children. And then Abraham blessing his, and Isaac, and Jacob, right down the line, generationally, hands are being extended, blessings are being expressed, and they're specific, and there's actually a whole lot of verses dedicated to those. And it, it went beyond those people. It went beyond the, the patriarchs in the Bible, in, in the family, because if you ever pull up the Talmud, it records all the traditions and the teachings of Jewish life tells us it was very customary for parents to bring their children to the elders of the synagogue wherever they were to receive that kind of blessing from them. These parents, knowing that, they said, I want to bring my children to Jesus. Which, by the way, is the greatest thing that you can ever do for your children. I saw a post this week. It said there's a 0.0296% chance that your child will ever become a professional athlete. But there's a 100% chance that they're going to stand before Jesus. Get them to church. Get them in his word. Mothers, fathers, our priorities are being wasted. Our parenting is going in a foolish direction. And our households are disobedient to him if we're not. And, and beyond just forfeiting today's blessings. I think what we're doing is we're sowing the seeds for tomorrow's griefs. We're investing ourselves in, in generational indifference. And I think even we're grieving the Holy Spirit. I think as Christians, as Christian parents, we are putting the Lord our God to the test every time we teach them to put him second. If you're hearing me this morning, if you've done that, you need to repent. Do it today. Don't do it tomorrow. We have so little time with them, precious time with them. Ask him to do what he says he can do in his word. Ask him to make up for the years that the locusts have eaten. He says he can do that in the book of Joel. Bring him to Jesus. Decide today. Make the decision today. I'm going to start bringing them to Jesus. Not just on Sundays every day of my life. I'm going to bring them to Jesus before I bring them anywhere else. Before I let the world take them anywhere else. That's what these parents were doing. But verse 13 says the disciples rebuked them. It wasn't the crowds getting in the way. It was the ones Jesus called out of the crowds to follow him, to represent him, to declare the coming kingdom, to preach and to heal in the way that he had to be, as we go on to find out, the foundation of the church that he was building. But instead of acting like a bridge for these people and their children, they were acting like a barbed wire fence. I mean, these kids, though, they couldn't possibly understand who he was, right? They're too young. They couldn't begin to know the man that they're being introduced to. But these disciples, you know, they knew. They knew. It took them like three years and hundreds of miracles. Some of them Jesus had to do twice in front of them for it to sink in. But, you know, they knew. They had it all figured out. Maybe they thought, you know, we're doing important things right now. And learning the deep truths of God. And we don't have time for this. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. All this is, is an interruption. This is an intrusion. This is a distraction. It's all the real ministry that's going on. These children don't matter right now. I mean, they, they don't need healing. You know, they don't need a miracle. All this is, is like a first century photo op. They don't have anything that they can contribute to the mission. This is all a waste of time. Get away. Well, Jesus... In whom Colossians says are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus, who made all things that have been made, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. Jesus, who will one day unroll the sky above us like a scroll. And bring about the consummation of this universe. And judge everything from the nations to the idle words that we speak. Jesus could not disagree more with what they did here. And Mark says that when he saw it, he was indignant. Only time in the Gospels that that word is ever used of him. It is actually the strongest word that is ever attached to Jesus in his response to anything. That's not said when he's casting out demons. 
That's not said when he's crying beside his bereaved and brokenhearted friends or facing down the cruelty of a hundred physical ailments as he'd done before after the toll that they'd taken on bodies and on families. That word doesn't get used when he's driving out money changers with a whip who'd invaded his father's house and robbed people under the guise of worship. It's not used there, so you tell me. What is the heart of Jesus Christ for children? Permit them to come to me, he says. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And I remind you of something so obvious. I think we overlook it a bunch. Maybe one time a year we think about it. The Jesus who opened blind eyes and raised the dead, preached the Sermon on the Mount, did all of those wonderful works we read about, said all those wonderful words we read about. He was a kid once. You know, we, we say that God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. But before he was God became a man Jesus, he was God became a baby Jesus. Maybe Christmas is the only time we, we think about that. The Apostles' Creed says he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, buried, raised. But we don't really talk a whole lot about what happened in the middle when eternal God entered into human history and took on the infirmities and limitations of, yes, flesh, blood, and bones, but also childhood. Luke mentions it just briefly. He summarizes Jesus' childhood by saying he kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with men. I want to summarize the point that I'm making by saying he dignified childhood. By first humbling himself to experience it. You think about it. He could have just kind of came down as a middle-aged man, right? He's God Almighty. He could have done that. He, he made Adam on day six by scooping up some dirt and breathing into it. He could have come down as a middle-aged man. But he dignified childhood by first humbling himself to experience it, and then by speaking so unmistakably about it. Places like this. There was a time in the flesh when Jesus couldn't feed himself. There was a time in the flesh when Jesus couldn't fend for himself. There was a time in the flesh where like that short-statured tax collector we read about in Luke chapter 19, he would have had to climb up a tree to see over a crowd of people, and nobody in that crowd would have wanted to see him because he was just a child. In fact, one time he got left behind in a caravan and he was missing for a whole day before anybody even realized it, Luke's Gospel tells us. He was a child. <coughs> and Jesus had already pointed out to his disciples, back in chapter 9, that to receive a child in his name was to receive him. And in receiving him, they would receive the one who sent him. And, and now, in front of them, in this story, they have this real-life opportunity to kind of do that. And they're turning away these tiny representatives of his father. Maybe they thought, when he said what he said before, that was just an illustration. He didn't really mean that. He meant it. child is open to receiving the truth like nobody else in this world is. They're children. They have simple faith. They have simple trust. If it had been children in the boat after Jesus fed the multitude when the disciples were worried because they hadn't brought any bread, you know what the children would have said? Jesus will feed us. Don't ever put them on the perimeter of life and ministry. Prioritize them. There's this verse in Hebrews that we like to think about. It's, it's about how we interact with strangers, showing hospitality to strangers. And it says, some by doing that have entertained angels without knowing it. Church, don't ever neglect to serve and welcome and pour yourself out for children. Because everyone who has, has served and welcomed and poured themselves out 
for God Almighty. And it's never a matter of not knowing. And it's never a maybe like the strangers and the angels because Jesus already told us this. We just need to see it the way God sees it. We just need to receive them the way he showed us to receive them when he took on flesh. And he demonstrated it to us. Which is, which is why making this really practical for a congregation that is full of believing people. We should never have to beg for volunteers for those ministries. And I'm grateful we haven't been. We've seen so many people throwing themselves into it, so many people volunteering their time, so many people, even ones that haven't been involved ever before, saying, you know what? The Lord would have me to do this, and it's, it's been a blessing. The kingdom belongs to such as these. By the way, Sue Milhorn, who coordinates our junior church ministry, who coordinates Kids for Truth, she's got knee surgery coming up at the end of September. We have a new opportunity. She's going to be down for a few weeks. We have a new opportunity to step into this. And I, I feel like just looking out that all the help that we need is already here. They just got to talk to her. I was even worried when she told me about her knee surgery. So I'm going to be out of commission for I was like, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Close all this out. I want us to take us to the communion table. And I want to explain why I call this message what I call it. I call it the children's table. When you're invited to a dinner someplace, Someone says to you to come over, have supper with us next week. You probably think, maybe you even ask, all right, well, what can I bring? Because you want to contribute something, right? Even if it's small. So you're taking, you're taking a dessert, you're taking an appetizer. Like you're at least taking something to drink. You're taking something. You don't want to show up empty-handed. But a child that goes to a dinner, he doesn't think about that, does he? Not even a little bit. It never once crosses his mind. He shows up. He sits down. And he eats. And he eats more. The Lord's table is the children's table. Come to it with empty hands and eat. Come to it with empty hands drink. Salvation is the gift of God given to us in the death of Jesus on the cross in our place. And if you've received that by faith, you have a place at this table. And if you've never come to Christ at all, come to him today. Receive him like a child. He will receive you. He will pick you up in those same arms that the scriptures call the everlasting arms. But once he's stretched out on a tree, he will pick you up in those arms and he will lay his nail-scarred hands on you and he will bless you. Elders, would you come?